Hi everyone, and it's so great to be part of this um, panel discussion today. My name is Atambila Masola, and I'm a lecturer at the University of Pretoria's English department, as well as the co-founder of Asna Kutula Collective. And today we are here to celebrate the book Malibongwe, which is an anthology um, that has been repatriated back into South Africa after many, many years. And this is part of, I see Kosi and Uhuru showing me their copies. And this is part of New Frame's celebration of the commune a year later. So on the 28th of September, 2019, the commune was launched, which is a bookshop uh, affiliated to New Frame and The Forge. And so we're really excited to be um, part of the celebration. And what better way to celebrate books than to celebrate a book about and by black women. So today's discussion, I have three wonderful people with me. Um, and it, as you can see, it's quite a, a rich, layered group of people with various voices and various experiences. Um, I'm going to introduce them officially um, because they are that important and that wonderful. We have Dr. Lindiwe Mabuza, who was the initial editor of Malibongwe under the name Sono Mulefe, and she is the former South African High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. She has six volumes of poetry published around the world. She was a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Minnesota and a professor of literature and history at Ohio University in Athens. She has an honorary doctorate from the University of Durban Westville and the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. We have Makosa Zanat Aba who wrote the introduction to Malibongwe and she is an anthologist, an essayist, a poet and a writer of short stories and is a research associate at the Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research. Her poetry has been anthologized widely and translated into Estosa, Italian, Japanese, Mandarin, Botswana and Turkish, and her edited anthologies have been translated into Spanish. And she has a, a, a creative writing MA from Wits University. And finally, we have Uhuru Palafala, who is a lecturer also in the English department, but at Stellenbosch University. And she is the 2018 University of Michigan African Presidential Scholar and the 2019 African Humanities Program Fellow. And she is also the Mellon Funded, she has a Millen funded research project called Recovering Subterranean Archives, which investigates South African culture in exile, and repatriates and publishes it, which is one of the projects that is responsible for the republication and repatriation of Malibongwe. And so for me, this is a conversation with people I deeply admire, with people I've had many conversations about this work. Kosi is one of my best feminist teachers. And so it's such mm -hmm. a privilege for me to be in conversation with all of you. So you. I, th I thought we Thank could Thank you, Atta. Um, and perhaps to, just as an introduction, um, I was chatting to Uhuru actually earlier this week. Um, we had our first idea together as Ula, and um, we spoke about the journey of the book. Each book has a journey. Um, and so my journey with this book was actually through you, Kosi. You told me that you were writing an introduction for this book. I had never heard about it ever before. And I found myself teaching it down the line. So already the life of the book in, is already, um, has been, uh, been used in universities already. I'm sure Hulu can share if, if we have time about her experiences in the book or wanting to teach the book and the significance of it not only for our scholarship, but also as a cultural production for our country. So, um, Dr. Mabuza, I'm going to start with you because you were the initial editor behind this book. Yes. Are you ready? Thank you so, so you were the initial me. editor. Well, I initiated the idea in the first place. Uh, and Uhuru goes into length describing how the process took place, how it started. But uh, I had been teaching 
literature for years in the United States. I'd been helping men in compiling their books on different things, poetry, short stories. And so I was in Zambia for the first time after many years away from Africa. And I find these wonderful ladies in Zambia, young women, activists, soldiers. I got the idea that it's important that we put something together with them. And of course, the, A the ANC women's uh, section at the time loved the idea. And that's how it started. But for me, I didn't really realize what a treasure we're going to get out of, of that initiative. Because this book is, a, is all kinds of things in one. It's history, it's literature, it's politics, it's anger, all the emotions that a human being can have because of the oppressive conditions of our people in South Africa. They are all there, raw, naked. And uh, I, I just think it, it came out to be more than what I expected. I, don't, I didn't know what would come out because I didn't give them any theme or topic. Just say, we want to put this book on, of poetry together. Just go and write. Do what you, you like to do with, with the idea. And, but when the submissions came in, the most surprising thing is that without discussing with each other, women were picking up similar things about the, the women, about Soweto, about oppression, the leadership, all kinds of things were coming without discussing together. And I think that's a marvel of the book that we're able, I was able in the end to put categories into that. Mm. I don't know if you want me to do more than that. Mm, that's a... But before, before, before I well, even- Well, perhaps uh, you could- mm -hmm. and... Go ahead. No, I want to say, really, for me, the greatest thing is to have the book at home. It was used for mobilization of people around the world. I think uh, Uru will talk to that. The, the translations of this book in different countries, different languages, <laughs> is in itself a testament to the popularity of the idea of a liberation movement to begin with, to come out with a, a book by women poets. I'll tell you, one of the greatest compliments the book had was from Oliver Tamb when he got the first copy. He was in Sweden then. And he took it, he looked at it, and he said, and this is us. It's ours. Later, I got to understand what he meant. He said, there's never been a book of poet poetry by liberation women anywhere else before. And so that in itself is a compliment to the ladies that are in the book. Unfortunately, we lost quite a number of them um, over the years. Thanks, Ma'am Lindy. I love how you, you draw the threads in together about how you, you didn't give the woman a template, but somehow they still managed to find and infuse that collective energy that they shared um, and they, their goals and, and they love, you've described them as lovers, lovers of freedom in, in your introduction, which is such a beautiful description of the work that they not only produce, but of the work of the words as well. Um, Kosi, I'd like to come to you. If you could say, you describe the woman as comrades come poets, which is such a beautiful description and a very hyphenated identity for, this, for these women. And you had met some of these women in, while you were in Lusaka, while in exile. Um, perhaps you could speak to, what did you find when you read the poetry? Because in, in the introduction, you described that it's a conversation between the past and the present. And you do quite a bit of detail just unpacking what is the meat of the, of the poetry? What is the beauty of the poetry? 
maybe I could just start by saying that I remember reading the two articles that I mentioned in the introduction, one written by, um, oh, now I forget the names, one written by Vangile and the other written by another scholar way back when I was doing research for something else. And I remember just thinking, wow, I remember hearing about this book when I was in exile, but I've never seen it. And what was interesting for me about the way that they wrote about the women made me want to hold the book in my hands, firstly. But also, they were coming from such different perspectives. Because while they were both rec uh, recognizing the fact that it was the that this was a special book because it's by women in exile and you know that hadn't quite been seen. The point that I really found myself pondering over and really wanting to hold the book in my hand was when one of the scholars talked about how, well, they wrote about their times, but they were not quite weaving the words, suggesting that the aesthetics mm. wasn't mm. I just thought, I want to hold this book in my hand and mm -hmm. see if I can confirm this. Mm -hmm. And so once I had the book in my hand, I thought, where do you come from? What does the aesthetics mean to you? What does weaving words mean exactly to you? Because the poetry is beautiful. It is beautiful. And in the introduction, I mentioned the point that Ndebele has been quoted on quite a lot in Jabulo Ndebele when he talks about literature in South Africa. And the point he's he was making was that it's so easy when you're writing about politics to focus on the dramatic and he calls it the spectacular without fo focusing on the ordinary. So for me, that is what I found very, very beautiful about most of the poetry because it, it it just focuses on some of the most detailed, beautiful, ordinary things under such difficult conditions. And so I was, I was excited by finding that. And so when I talk about the past and the present, I remember thinking, hmm, I wonder if Njabulo had seen this book, mm. what he would have said differently. But coming back to the comparison, it doesn't matter where the poetry is located within the sections of the book. I've found the themes of hope and the desire for having the land back for Black people coming out very, very strongly in the poems. Mm -hmm. So where are we right now? Mm -hmm. We keep talking about the dawn as we quote the president in his speech recently, but we haven't stopped hoping and we're hoping for things to change because where we're at right now is, where, is not where we thought we'd be. We can have a long, long list, whether we're talking about violence against women, whether we're talking about corruption, which has come as such a surprise. So the theme of hope was in the poems then, but the specifics of the hope at the time was that we would be free. And now we could say we still want to be free from corruption. We still want to be free from violence that we experience as women. So it was interesting for me to see how the same word could be used, even though the specifics are different. And then there's the land question. It was easy to say, oh, the land question, apartheid, they did this. And we still haven't resolved that land question, right? which is why we're still talking about it at this time in 2020. So the, the strength of those two themes for me was just showing how the past actually lives in the present, that the specifics mm. might change, but the broader ideas haven't really changed, which isn't to say that not much has changed, because I also hate it when people say, oh, apartheid was better. It wasn't but there's a lot that still hasn't changed the way we expected it would have changed by now. I love the... the... <laughs> Uri, I, you wanna jump in? I am excited by this idea of the past 
uh, still in the present. And um, I think that Kosi's introduction does such a wonderful weaving job herself. It's like a, a corrective kind of approach to the criticism of the book for its lack of weaving. She, she then brings out the weaving, then adds on to the practice of weaving herself, weaving the past, the present and future. And I just love that, you know, the book comes in to kind of give us the past to weave the present and the future with. In the absence of the book, we would not be able to know that these questions have been raised before by women who look like us, who, who, who fought for our freedom. So we would not have that particular piece that would enable us to thread a deeper history of this present moment that we are in. Mm. And that almost happened, not by mistake, but it wasn't planned. That's just the ways in which the voices come together. As Mam Lindy had said, you know, there wasn't a brief for these women, but they simply shared what was on their, what was experience, which is so beautifully weaved in and of itself. Um, Huru, maybe you could say more about the, the journey of the book. The, why was it important for you to repatriate? You use this word a lot, to repatriate the book. Why was it important for you to do that? And how did, how did that process unfold? Um, yeah, it's um, really um, such a, a, a great privilege to, to have had the opportunity to repatriate this book, to republish it. It falls under the uh, larger project that I run called Recovering Subterranean Archives, which is a project that does exactly that. It investigates uh, South African cultural production, so more than just literature, all of our culture that was uh, produced in exile and remains there even uh, post our democratic moment, so that we are in this dispensation and we are still not aware of what our predecessors, our elders, what they were up to in exile, what were their cultural, political, socioeconomic uh, uh, contributions, what it is that they produced, how it circulated. We don't know any of that. So this came for me um, as a personal kind of challenge when I was doing my PhD on the late Georapetz Khosetzile, and I really could not find any of his collection of poetries in the country. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I still have <laughs> now, we're looking for Mam Lindi Wemabuza's collections of poetry in the country. They are not available, you know. Um, so I decided that this is something I wanted to pursue to really uh, make a, a, a concerted effort to find the funding and go look for this cultural production with some colleagues um, from other universities who are working within South African culture under apartheid. And it was by sheer chance and perhaps serendipity that I knew about this anthology. Um, and uh, it, it really, for me, represented something of a gap, not only in our archives of uh, South African literature, South African history, South African politics, but in a, a gap in my own development as a, a poet, as an artist, as a Black female who is young and living in this, in this uh, post-94 moment. So that is to say that the rep repatriation of the book itself does not only fill the gap in our archives, uh, whether be it in academia or in South African literature, but it also comes to give us as, um, as the younger generation who come after this generation that was in exile, it gives us the foundation, it gives us the, a tradition uh, that we can know existed, that we, are working within a tradition that was established so that we don't feel like we are pioneering in the work that we do, which as sometimes it sounds sophisticated and nice to pioneer, but it's difficult work when you have to uh, break a new path. So this book has come to show us that the path has been made and uh, we can just you know, take where our elders have left off 
and carry the work that they have already done forward. Mm. Maybe just before we read some of the poems, Mamlimdi, could you say more about the, the roots? Because it's quite a transnational book. So while it emerges from Zambia, could you, can you just trace us where it was published? Um, I remember at the launch on the 9th of August, we had someone read a translation. Was it in Dutch? Um, and so there's, it's actually quite transnational. And the fact that it's happening for the first time in South Africa is quite significant as well. I mean, the glory for me about the fact is the fact that Uhuru discovered the book. The book has been in some libraries in this country, I found out later. Somebody phoned me from Rhodes University, a, a white guy, to mm -hmm. ask if I knew about uh, something about this. I said, yes. He just was doing his research. And that's the, that was the end of it. I also found out that UNISA has a copy. But to take, to have a copy and keep it in the library is not the same as saying, this must go to our people. It belongs here. We must spread it. The word must go around that these young ladies in exile did write poetry, did think, you know, how did I come to write? Let me tell you this funny story. I was in Swaziland after leaving South Africa. And who do I meet? The Ken Temba, the great Ken Temba. We had been having some conversations with him and others. And one day he came to where I lived and he said, I've come to tell you one thing. You've got to write, Lindy. I said, me write? Yes, you've got to write. I know you can write if you set your mind to it. Well, that idea I stored in, my, in the back of my mind, I didn't do any writing. And when I was in the United States, I had to teach black children literature and poetry of South Africa and the United States of black people. The children didn't want to do anything with literature. Oh, that's boring, they would say. We don't want to do that. Can't we do something? I, then I started getting them to write. I said, if I gave you a million dollars, write how we are going to spend that money. Oh, the excitement. <laughs> they started writing, and then we critiqued the thing in class. Which was the best one? Why was it good? They were able to discover the writers in that class. And in the end, they said, why don't you write too? Ken Temba came to my mind in that context. That yes, it's a challenge for me. I've challenged these children and they are responding. And now they are challenging me back with an idea that grew out of one of the greatest writers of this country, Ken Temba. I never stopped from there on. So I'm saying, Uhuru, you, you've done a historical gigantic thing to bring the book home so that it's there in the public domain. It's not in some seclusive corners of some university, for example. Mm -hmm. It will be there, but it must be in the classroom. It must be in the homes as well. I can't thank you enough for that, really. Because we didn't even think, well, we were using the book on Radio Freedom for our culture uh, programs. Many times people would read poetry from, from the book, but we never really conceived that, saw the book at home. Mm. And you've mm. done it. It, it, it. It's really beyond words. It's a historical giant step. I agree. Yeah, like, I, I am speechless. I am speechless and can only say it's a it's a great honor. I don't know who should thank who. Me finding this book gave me, it filled a gap, a void in me, a hunger, a thirst. So I have uh, more gratitude to you for putting it together so we can go back and forth thanking each other. <laughs> 
but for me this this book came to heal me it it uh, and i'm sure um it does so for many others whose hands it lands in today mm. I'm very curious about how the students are responding to the book at Tambile. Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, we had online teaching. So, mm. the way that I, I had to teach it was that I did pre recorded lectures. And I had four lectures, and I was tracking the lectures using, I started sort of from the early um, 20th century with Nunzis and Koitwa and Adelaide Tansi. And then I looked at poetry in the 1940s and 60s with um, Hamsi, Kathleen, Jeffries, together with um, Joyce Kakane. And then I jumped to the 70s and 80s, which is where I placed Malimongwe in conversation with Staff Rider and the women who were in Staff Rider. And I discovered that some of the poems that were in Malimongwe had also been published in Staff Rider. So that was a nice um, con conversation, I guess. And then I ended with contemporary poets. Um, using your your book, Our Words, Our World. So that's how I framed it. But um, I got a lot of emails because there wasn't interaction immediately because what we do is you, you do the lecture, you record it, and then you post it and students watch it in their own time. So I, I received a lot of emails saying you've released a whole new world. None of them, um, none of the students came to me saying, um, you know, why did you include it or whatever the case is, but rather it was we've never been exposed to this. And in fact, we don't understand why we haven't been exposed. So this was a second year group, um, English 220. Um, and many of them had just never encountered. And also I located it within the, the department anthology, which didn't have, um, so I counted about 60 poets, I think in the, full, in the whole anthology. And only, I mean, less than 20 of those, um, if not, I think 12, I even counted. I did the enumeration that you always do, Kosti. And I counted. Mm. Um, so Jumanga Mutawong was there, you're <laughs> in there, Lebo Mashile is in there, and there are a few, but they don't reach 20 black women. And so then to contrast the department anthology with, um, for example, Mali Bongo, as well as other anthologies was quite something. So I received a lot of feedback that you've released a whole new world for them. So that's the conversation I had with my students. And so I hope to do it again next year because I'm going to um, continue. And I think I want to give it more room other than the, the actual anthology. I just want to add that, you know, um, I spent the better uh, part of my preface to the new edition in just um, expressing my awe in how this book moved around, how it was translated um, in Europe, how it moved in networks of solidarity, of fundraising, of creating awareness uh, of the apartheid struggle, how some, well, one poem uh, in the book came out of South Africa during that time of severe censorship, of severe surveillance. Uh, so I think that I could not. I was just in awe of, you know, 1980, 1981. How do you make a call to uh, women in the camps of the ANC to write poetry? How do you move it? It was the days before internet, you know? It, it really, we must, we must really think about what a, what a staggering kind of undertaking that was and to, to, to put it together and have it translated in uh, so many other European languages, uh, supported by uh, structures of solidarity that demonstrate women's efforts in diplomatic relations within the ANC. Man, it is really, um, it's, we must sit with, with, with what this book represents and really look at ourselves and, and um, and reject that notion that black women um, didn't contribute to, I don't know, resistance politics, didn't re uh, uh, contribute to radical politics. This book is, is that, it's all of it. Like Mam Lindy was said, it's not only poetry, it is, uh, it is literature, it is uh, international affairs, it is a book of, a work of translation, a work of, uh, solidarity making, world making, it's, I, 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 I really can't, uh, yeah, I, I, 
<laughs> I'm in awe of, of, of these efforts in the, in the early 80s. The fact that the book got to have all those translations tells you about the nature of the solidarity movements around the world, that the most hardworking, the real dynamite in that work was done by women. So as soon as they saw a book by ANC women, they were just so excited. They couldn't stop wanting to have it into everybody's hands. That's, that's really the, the unwritten part of the story, that women's movements around the world were really in the center of the anti-apartheid struggle. That's why we got so much support for this. I'm going to read um, a poem by Lindy Wemabuza, who is the editor of this uh, anthology. It's called Soweto Wishes, and it's on page 77 for those who want to follow. Please put a gun in this itching hand, for I almost tasted victory when the enemy dazed. But words, spears, and stones cannot pierce the heart of our pain. Somebody please place weapons in these palms that have just toyed with rattles while lullabies were hummed. For I too have heard songs rise from Angolan wars won, but their refrain will not drown some echoes from the home front battlefield. With gun in hand, I could feel the fire of joy, for I would be one with many whose tears I must drain. Those tearing screams from disemboweled bodies must be hushed forever. Please let me bear its weight on my growing shoulders, for although I'm only a cub, I have worn the armor of men, knowing the deeds of years that were planted have fertilized our land. With new dawn's energy, I must strengthen my sinews, for I have seen creatures stampede and build icebergs in liberty's path. But volcanic tides will charge, making love to our own plows, which must now furrow for life. That was Soweto Wishes by Oman Lindy Wemabuza. This was the wish of young people. Tens of thousands of children were leaving South Africa. They were looking for Tambo, looking for education. I think this one came after I'd visited the camps in Angola and found a 14-year-old girl. She has a poem in this book. Uh, Jeanette Solwandle is one of the, the, the authors here. At 14, I said, what, what are you doing here? I said, how oh, mom, there's war going on. I must be trained properly as a soldier. You couldn't stop young people when they said, we have lost our comrades on the way here. They told gory stories of young children who were beaten by snakes on the way. One girl actually was beaten by a snake, a poisonous snake, and they left her body there because they had to march on forward. But the, the pictures were haunting them. But so talking to Jeanette, I realized there's many Jeanettes here. You talk about education. Yes, we need education, but please let me train first. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have to be responsible parents too, as the ANC leadership that you couldn't allow all the children to really go for military training. That's why we built a school, started building a school in Tanzania. 
at its height, that school had about 1,500 people, mainly students. It had, it was meant to be high school. We had a primary school. We even had a crash, all levels. And it became a vibrant community. So thank you for choosing that poem because this struggle, they said, well, we saw our comrades on the streets of Soweto falling, shot by young war boys. If those boys were trained, we can train as well. Mm. Mm. Thanks for sharing that reflection, Mamangi. Um, Kosi, would you like to read a poem? Uh, yes, I think I will read the very first poem in the very first section, Africa Shall Be Free, by Ilva, oh, the section is called Africa Shall Be Free, the poem is called Masichaba by Ilva McCain on page 34. Africa, mother of children, impatient, reluctant to be like the rivers that meander to the seas. Africa, mother of children, destitute, but dying, sorry, destitute, dying, but determined to prescribe themselves freedom, to describe themselves free. Africa, your children no longer nestle in your arms, crawl on your belly, accept their fate, dumb and silent. Your children have rejected their garments of indifference, of docile acceptance. Your children no longer, your children, sleep and do not sleep. Africa, the voice of your children erodes the mist-shrouded mountains like hungry rain and cuts through the valleys like the pounding rivers that ravage and rape your fields. Africa, today your rivers heal our wounds, your fields offer us refuge, and your mountains do not silence. No, they, no. They hold and harbor the sounds of warriors answering the call of justice. So this is one of the poems that I really like because for me it speaks to, yes, the idea of hope, but also it has this, this Pan-African feel that I like because when I read this poem, I don't just hear the struggle for South Africa's liberation. I hear the story of the continent I hear the story of colonization. I hear the story of independence from the very, of, but very beautifully. Thank you, Posse. Mam Lindy, would you like to end this off on a reading of any of the poems? Okay, let me read. Uh, I'm trying to get a poem that is different from the spirit of fighting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to hear that. Yes. I don't know where I'll find it, this but I'm sure put together to with the spirit of fighting. I'm like, which one would that be? Are you which looking one? in this book? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, let me try this one. To your comrades is a poem that I wrote. Uh, I wrote it when I was working for Radio Freedom. A dear friend had just left us. He had been so powerful a voice with Radio Freedom. Radio Freedom was the broadcast service of the ANC from studios in Zambia, in Angola, in uh, Tanzania in Madagascar and uh, we were working from the radio, uh, radio Zambia studios in Lusaka and he left us so there is a little bit of pain about that 
but he was a soldier. He had to go to another arena of struggle. Oh, so he didn't die. When you said he left us, I thought you were meaning he died. No, he didn't die. He, he, he just oh. left. He was assigned elsewhere. Okay. Um, if I go to that, can I do a short poem that I did? It has no gun, it has no blood. It's, it was done when I was teaching in the United States. And I thought this lady and I were good friends. I thought she knew what my political positions were. So she gets engaged and she comes boasting to me, dangling her finger. Look, look, Lindy, a real Kimberly. She had just gotten engaged. And I said, what's that? She said, from your country, a diamond, Kimberly diamond. <laughs> and this is how this, this poem started. When they see love, oh, it's Agape 157. Oh. When they see love with smiling clusters of diamonds, they never tell about the dark depths looming behind. When they say love is like a red, red rose, some never tell about the green thorns guarding the petals. Oh. Nor can they who remember fully relish the honeycomb when the thumb swells blue from all the stings. Oh. But in the free and obedient hive of our growing love, Worker bees honor the rose erect. The brilliance of the future, partaking of today's dark thorns. Oh wow! This okay. is such this is such important background information. <laughs> oh, wow! Okay, I have a new frame with which to <laughs> read this poem. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Mam Lindy. Wow. Yeah, don't we say how is love expressed? It express it's expressed in terms of roses and people calling each other honey. And uh, but this gives it a new twist. Absolutely. Definitely. But um thank you so much for 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 gathering today. I know uh to gather over Zoom and to launch a book over Zoom is no small feat given all the, the fatigue and the Zoom fatigue. But thank you for making the time to gather over words, to gather about history, to gather about women. And um, I hope that people watching this will be inspired to get hold of the book that they can buy from the commune, which is the bookshop in Johannesburg in Bramfontein for people who are interested. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's a beautiful gift for us to have in 2020, in spite of the challenges we've had with, with Corona and the lockdown that we can still gather. So thank you so much to each of you for your time. I'm Lindy, Uhuru and Kosi. It's been a real pleasure and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Atta. Thank you.